This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. If you click the link in the description, you'll also get access to my streaming video service, Nebula, for less than $15 a year in total. You can watch the extended edition of this video and my Nebula original, A Brief History of Synthesizers, on Nebula now. Jay Dilla died at home in Los Angeles on February 10th, 2006, just three days after his 32nd birthday. After fighting illness for years, he succumbed to a combination of lupus, and a rare blood disease that left him so weak he was unable to walk and could barely find the strength to talk. But while he struggled to survive during his final days, he was working around the clock on the most important piece of art he would ever create, Donuts. 29 out of 31 tracks on Donuts were recorded in a hospital in LA in the summer of 2005, while Dilla underwent a number of invasive and expensive procedures, including dialysis. He made the album with his mother by his side, massaging his fingers when the pain from his illness made him too weak to control his sampler and record player. After some delays, Donuts was released on February 7th, 2006, Jay Dilla's birthday. His friends Madlib, Peanut Butter Wolf, Egon, and Jay Rock visited him on the day of the album's release, only to find him at home, unable to speak or even gesture weakly. Three days later, Jay Dilla went into cardiac arrest and passed away at the age of 32. But the end of his life didn't spell the end of his artistic legacy. In fact, Jay Dilla's music has only become more appreciated and more influential over the years, with Donuts now being considered one of the best instrumental hip-hop albums of all time, and one of the best albums of its decade. Many people even consider Jay Dilla the inventor of lo-fi hip-hop and one of the most influential producers in the history of the genre. Let's talk about that. There are so many skills that go into making a good beat. You have to choose good snares, kicks, bass, hi-hats. You have to either sample, program, or record a melody. You have to mix the beat. You have to structure the chords. It's a very complex craft. But Questlove, the drummer in Philadelphia band The Roots, said in a 2012 interview that one of the strangest things about Jay Dilla was that he wasn't even a musician in the classical sense. He just had a sound in his head and was able to put it onto tape flawlessly. He clarified what he meant with a story from the recording sessions for Welcome to Detroit, Jay Dilla's debut album. The day after he recorded Think Twice for Welcome to Detroit, I look at the drum set and I was like, Wait, you recorded that on this? And it was the most dingiest, dirtiest, not even secondhand. It looked like the Fat Albert Junkyard Gang drum set. Screws were missing, some of the heads were broken. Matter of fact, he didn't even use real drumsticks on Think Twice. He used a vibraphone mallet, and he had a broken drumstick that he got some toilet paper from the bathroom and some rubber bands. I was like, you would rather go through this MacGyver shit than buy new drumsticks? And he was like, I didn't know where to get them this late at night. I had to make two. I was like, well, why did you hit the drums with the mallet? He said, I didn't want the dynamic to be too aggressive. I wanted it to sound muted, so I decided to play the drums with a soft cotton mallet. It looked like putting a marshmallow at the end of a toothpick. Next thing I know, I'm flying to Philadelphia, I think the next week, to work on the new Roots record. I tracked both Quills and Pussy Galore the same way. I went and got some orchestra mallets, and then I too got started, just because I had seen how he got that sound. Basically, Jay Dilla had a natural talent for creating unique sounds from any tools he had access to. And his sampling techniques would go on to change hip hop forever. But before he added nuance and compositional complexity to the practice of sampling, Dilla himself was inspired by DJ Marley Marl and Pete Rock, two producers and DJs from New York. Marley Marl was one of the first producers to sequence new drum patterns by chopping individual drum sounds from popular drum breaks and Pete Rock followed in his footsteps by being one of the first producers in the 90s to start looping jazz and funk samples in hip-hop beats. It's important to know about these guys from New York who came before Dilla, because they served as such a big inspiration to him, but the thing about Dilla is that he took their techniques even further by using his MPC 3000 to create entirely new rhythmic, harmonic, and melodic material from samples. In a 2013 interview, Questlove described Jay Dilla's ability to chop a sample as being equivalent to solving a 10,000 piece puzzle in record time. Another fundamental aspect of Jay Dilla's production was a lack of quantization. For those who don't know, quantizing is the process that you use in order to perfectly line up all of the melodies that you play uh, using MIDI. So let's say you play a keyboard melody on uh, whatever MIDI keyboard and 
you might have made some errors you might have like some of the uh, the keys that you press weren't perfectly lined up when you use quantization you set whether you want it to quantize based on a 16 for an eighth note having uh, come to so prominence so in the late 80s yeah. quantization had become an industry standard technique jay dilla however didn't use the quantizing functions on his mpc 3000 in an attempt to make the music sound more human and less electronic he sequenced his drums like he was playing a real drum set this resulted in his kick patterns often being completely offbeat in relation to the rest of the percussion. But thanks to his incredible talent, he was able to create laid back, comfortable sounding beats that just worked. Dilla was also known for the way he used his Moog synth to create bass lines. Before Dilla, hip hop bass lines were most often just sampled from older music genres like funk or soul, such as Dr. Dre's frequent use of George Clinton bass lines. But Jay Dilla actually used his Moog synth to create counter melodies that contrasted the main melodies of the instrumental. On the Slum Village song Get This Money, he composed a counter melody to the sample of Herbie Hancock's Come Running To Me that served as the primary melody in the song's beat. While the main vocal melody descends chromatically, Dilla's bass line sticks to an Aeolian model counter melody, as opposed to playing only the pedal bass notes featured in the chord progression. Dilla's natural mastery of music theory and composition propelled him to levels of great influence among his contemporaries. During his lifetime, he produced songs for A Tribe Called Quest, De La Soul, Busta Rhymes, Janet Jackson, Fife Dog, The Roots, Common, and Ghostface Killa. Posthumously, his beats have been used or sampled on tracks by Drake, Big Sean, Erica Badu, Joey Badass, Nas, Lupe Fiasco, and XXXTentacion. And while that's a significant legacy on its own, I think Jay Dilla's biggest contribution to the music industry lives on not on major streaming platforms, but rather on YouTube live streams and beat tapes. You see, there's an entire subgenre of hip hop found primarily on YouTube that uses techniques pioneered by Jay Dilla. Right now at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, there are more than 70,000 viewers watching dozens of different live streams all dedicated to playing relaxing lo-fi beats, almost all of which are heavily inspired by the work of Jay Dilla. In the words of Ryan Celsius, the owner of Ryan Celsius Sounds, the whole idea of lo-fi hip-hop is sonic nostalgia, but not in an overly aggressive or ironic way like Vaporwave or Retrowave. It's usually beat production that can sound undermixed, containing intended or unintended imperfections, with a heavy focus on creative sample use and authentic sounding drum kits. It's usually a tape hiss or some analog distortion set against a simple set of drum loops and an incredible sample selection. In short, the sound of lo-fi hip hop is taken directly from the playbook of Jay Dilla. Hell, the soundtracks to my own videos are inspired heavily by his music, and I often seek out songs that best fit the atmosphere he created. It's the perfect feel for a video intended to relax and help the viewer learn. While Jay Dilla's connection to the sound of lo-fi hip-hop may be obvious, his relationship to its aesthetic isn't as clear. The look of lo-fi hip-hop is closely tied to anime and Japanese illustration, with that connection coming from a different yet equally influential source. Nujabe's, a Japanese record store owner and beatmaker, who was also considered one of the most influential and beloved lo-fi producers of all time. In 2004, he provided music for the anime Samurai Champloo, which would later go on to become a cult classic show. The anime, in addition to hip-hop beats from Yujabes, featured jazz songs that proved influential to the lo-fi genre as well. I think the emotional connection between anime and lo-fi hip-hop goes a bit deeper than that as well. One of the biggest themes in anime is the appreciation of the moment, a feeling of coziness and nostalgia and sentimentality that you just can't quite put your finger on. The influence of Jay Dilla on mixing and arrangement fits perfectly with that sentiment. His use of vinyl static and rough mixing, relaxed laid back drum sequences and beautiful melodies would go on to inspire thousands of producers to chase the lo-fi sound, creating music for quiet moments of focus, concentration and appreciation. In the same way Jay Dilla kept a collection of more than 7,000 vinyl records, lo-fi producers today pour through obscure recordings uploaded to YouTube to find the perfect sample. Though he died without reaching the full recognition his talent deserved, Jay Dilla's legacy lives on today online, 
with new young fans all over the world falling in love with his work and the massive community he influences to this day. And his work is far from forgotten in the industry, too. In addition to the production credits I mentioned earlier, his instruments are displayed in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History. And it all started with a kid from Detroit who had a crate of records and an MPC 3000. What you just watched wasn't the full version of this video. You see, I barely make money off of YouTube ads. I made $500 this month off of 1 million views. And my video about Travis Scott made me less than $150 in total, despite giving me more than 12,000 subscribers, a million views, and taking two weeks to make. And many of my other videos are in a similar situation as well, about half in total, leading to thousands of dollars in lost revenue. In short, it's hard being a creator when you don't control your own platform. That's why my friends and I teamed up to build our own platform where creators don't need to worry about demonetization or the dreaded algorithm. It's called Nebula, and we're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream. Nebula is a place where creators can do what they do best, create. It's a place where we can both house our content ad-free and also experiment with new content and new series that might not work on YouTube. In fact, if you liked this episode, the version I put up on Nebula removes this ad entirely and replaces it with an extended version of the video. Nebula features lots of YouTube's top educationalist creators, like our newest additions Adam Neely, Charles Cornell, Mary Spender, and tons of others. We also get to collaborate in ways that wouldn't work on YouTube, like my own original A Brief History of Synthesizers, where I explore the history of synths in popular music. I'm very proud of it, and you should go check it out. But what does this all have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, they love educational content and want to support educational creators. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, not only will you get CuriosityStream, you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And to be clear, that Nebula subscription is not a trial. It's free for as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering a big discount on all of their annual plans. Right now, it costs less than $15 a year to be a member of CuriosityStream and get a free Nebula subscription too. So since we've got to stay inside, we might as well be soothed by the voice of David Attenborough narrating tales about tiny hummingbirds, or join astronaut Chris Hadfield on a road trip through the universe. Or just watch me talk about synths for 15 minutes straight. So either way, if you click the link in the description, you'll get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. Or you can go to curiositystream.com slash Volksgeist. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $14.79 per year. Just click on the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Volksgeist. Clicking on the link really helps out this channel.